Hi kids, we're back with Beverly Cleary's The Mouse and the Motorcycle. And remember they've just gotten to the motel and he got his own room, he's got his own room. And so he's looking around the room and enjoying himself. Next, Keith opens his suitcase and took out an apple and several small cars, a sedan, a sports car, and an ambulance about six inches long, and a red motorcycle half the length of the cars, which he dropped on the striped bed spread before he bit into the apple. He ate the apple noisily in big, chomping bites, and then laid the core on the bedside table between the lamp and the telephone. Keith began to play, running his cars up and down the bedspread, pretending that the stripes on the spread were highways and making noises with his mouth. Vroom, vroom for the sports car. Whee, whee, whee for the ambulance and for the motorcycle up and down the stripes. Once Keith stopped suddenly and looked quickly around the room as if he expected to see something or someone, but when he saw nothing unusual, he returned to his cars. Vroom, vroom, bang, crash! The sports car hit the sedan and rolled off the highway stripe. The motorcycle came roaring to the scene of the crash. Keith, his mother called from the next room. Time to get washed for dinner. Okay, Keith parked his cars in a straight line on the bedside table beside the telephone, where they looked like a row of real cars, only much, much smaller. The first thing Mrs. Gridley noticed when she and Mr. Gridley came into the room was the apple core on the table. She dropped it with a thunk into the metal, into the metal waste basket beside the table as she gave several quick little sniffs of the air and said, looking perplexed, I don't care what the bellboy said. I'm sure this hotel has mice. I hope so, muttered Keith. Number two, chapter, the motorcycle. Except for one terrifying moment when the boy had poked his finger through the mouse hole, a hungry young mouse named Ralph eagerly watched everything that went on in room 216. At first he was disappointed at the size of the boy who was to occupy the room. A little child, preferably two or even three children, would have been better. Less messy children were always considerable very considerate about leaving crumbs on the carpet. Oh well, at least these people did not have a dog. There was one thing Ralph disliked, it was a Snoopy dog. Next, Ralph felt hopeful. Medium-sized boys could almost always be counted on to leave a sticky candy bar wrapper on the floor or a bag of peanuts on the bedside table where Ralph could reach them by climbing up the telephone cord. With a boy this size, the food, though not apt to be plentiful, was almost sure to be of good quality. The third emotion felt by Ralph was joy when the boy laid the apple core by the telephone. This was followed by despair when the mother dropped the core into the metal wastebasket. Ralph knew that anything at the bottom of a metal wastebasket was lost to a mouse forever. A mouse does not live by crumbs alone, and so Ralph experienced still other emotions. This time, food was not the cause of it. Ralph was eager, excited, curious, and impatient all at once. The emotion was so strong it made him forget his empty stomach. It was caused by those little cars, especially the motorcycle and the sound the boy made. That sound seemed to satisfy something within Ralph as if he had been waiting all his life to hear it. Went the boy. To the mouse, the sound of spokes of highways and speed of distance and danger and whiskers blown back by the wind. The instant the family left the room to go to dinner, Ralph scurried out of the mouse hole and across the th threadbare carpet to the telephone cord, which came out of a hole in the floor beside the bedside table. Ralph scolded his mother from the mouse hole. You stay away from that telephone cord. Ralph's mother was a great worrier. She worried because their hotel was old and run down and because so many rooms were often empty with no careless guests to leave crumbs behind for mice. She worried about the rumor that their hotel was to be torn down when the new highway came through. She worried about her children finding aspirin tablets. Ralph's father had tried to carry an aspirin tablet in his cheek pouch. The aspirin had dissolved with unexpected suddenness and Ralph's father had been poisoned. 
Since then, no member of the family would think of touching an aspirin tablet, but this did not prevent Ralph's mother from worrying. Most of all, Ralph's mother worried about Ralph. She worried because he was a reckless mouse who stayed out late in the daytime when he should have been home safe in bed. She worried when Ralph climbed the curtains to sit on the windowsill to watch the chipmunk in the pine tree outside and the cars in the parking lot below. She worried because Ralph wanted to go exploring down the hall instead of traveling under the floorboards like a sensible mouse. Heaven only knew what dangers he might meet in the hall. Maids, bellboys, perhaps even cats, or what was worse, of the vacuum cleaners. Ralph's mother had a horror of vacuum cleaners. Ralph, who was used to his mother's worries, got a good running start and was already halfway up the telephone cord. Remember your Uncle Victor, his mother called after him. Ralph seemed not to hear. He climbed the cord up to the telephone, jumped down, and ran around to the row of cars. There it was on the end, the motorcycle. Ralph stared at it and then walked over and kicked a tire. Close up, the motorcycle looked even better than he expected. It was new and shiny and had a good set of tires. Ralph walked all the way around it, examining the pair of chromium mufflers and the engine and the hand clutch. It even had a little license plate so it would be legal to ride it. Episode three will be next.